And that's all we need. If we just stay obedient to Jesus, we're going to be fine. The word of Jesus unto these people was to repent. In Genesis 6, 6, we read the following. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. The literal translation of this word spelled sheen bet in the conventional Hebrew is to return or to turn about. Curiously, the first time the word repentance is used, it has nothing to do with man repenting. Let's read the passage again from Genesis 6.6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. The real scary part of the concept of God repenting can be discovered in the following verse where in Genesis 6-7 we read the following, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping things, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. In the conventional Hebrew there are actually two words that are translated repent, repentance, or regret. We're going to explore the picture meaning of both words, starting with the Hebrew word for repent that is spelled sheen bet. Sheen is pictured as teeth, and it means to consume, to press, and to destroy. Bet, the second letter in the Hebrew word translated repent, is the picture of a house or a tent. The two pictures of sheen and bet are connected in a way you may find surprising. Instead of turn or burn, as it's understood in the English translation, the Hebrew word sheen bet has another idea. Sheen bet is a destroying or burning of the house. In other words, it's burning the house down. It could literally be translated, burn or destroy the place you're living in and then turn around and leave. The concept is eloquently simple. If you burn the house down, then you cannot return to live there. Unless, of course, you wish to spend your life living among the charred ashes of death and destruction. Sadly, some actually do end up returning to live in a pile of ashes. To repent based on the ideal picture meaning of Sheen Bet is to leave the place you were living, never to return. The place you were living needs to be crushed, burned down, demolished, and destroyed so that there is never any reason to return. Obviously, the spiritual implications of this picture are not lost on anyone. Isaiah 1, 16-18 states, Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. we need. If we just stay obedient to Jesus, we're going to be fine. The word of Jesus unto these people was to repent and go back to your first love. And I want to read an excerpt from the ministry of the Apostle Paul in Ephesus. And I tell you what, when he talks about fighting the beasts in Ephesus, there was a riot there because he was speaking against Diana. There was an uproar and a riot. And in Acts chapter 19, uh, beginning in verse 17, it says, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And he's referring back here to the, the son of Sceva, when the son of Sceva tried, uh, and he was one of these Jews, and let's just, I'm just going to take time to back up and read this, because this is so in context with these people that they were ethnic Jews. We've got the, the Ebionites and other sects that were there that, let's just read what happened. He says, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preached. They were Jews 
and they thought that by saying a name, they could have power. This is still inherent in the sacred name movement. They think they can say the name of God, say the name of Jesus a certain way, and that's going to get the job done for them. Well, it doesn't work. He says, and there were seven sons of one Skeva. A I was trained by the sons of Skeva. Hey, guys. I hate to interrupt David, but since he's talking about the sons of Skeva, I think you should probably uh, take a minute and watch this video of Chris Valentin trained by sons of Skeva. And work. He says, and there were seven sons of one Skeva, a Jew and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was <laughs> leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. He literally beat their pants off, stripped them naked, and they were running off. I mean, this is what's going to happen to you. If you get into this demonic nonsense, you're going to get your butt stripped naked when you try to fight the beasts of Ephesus. It's amazing. And when this happened in verse 17, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and shewed their deeds, many of them also which used curious arts. And when the Jews cast out devils, they did it Kabbalistically. And there, there's all kinds of Kabbalistic books. The writings of the Kabbalah began when they were in captivity in Babylon, and they begin to mix the Babylonian religion with the faith in the word of God. Many of them also, which use curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and they found it 50,000 pieces of silver. You see, when you repent, you don't repent halfway. You repent all the way. You don't come a little bit out of this demonic air. You come completely out. You cut yourself off from it. You burn those books. You get rid of it. You come out. And this was. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. These doctrines of devils, that's the Kabbalah. That's exactly what Bethel is teaching. The Kabbalah is the foundation upon which all Freemason teachings are based. To understand that Raziel is the one that gave the people the doctrine of devils please go watch this video explaining the Kabbalah divination Bethel's treasure hunts comes from the Kabbalah Sozo we noticed that Bill Johnson's inner healing program called Sozo starts with the father, father ladder as the first step for healing the main symbol of the first degree and of Freemasonry is generally Jacob's Ladder. Please see picture one that's inside this video. Masonic tracing board is a ladder to God. Mason symbology, climbing to heaven, it's Kabbalah doctrine. Through it, they are supposed to perfect themselves degree by degree until they are worthy of eternal life in the heavens. They do it without Jesus by works, but we know that that's a lie and is unbiblical. Bethel Seven Mountain Mandate is Templar theology. Templars are 32nd degree Freemasons, including Bill Johnson. That would be based on Kabbalah. At the beginning of this video, my friend gives her testimony about witnessing 
her dad and Bill Johnson having an argument about Bill Johnson needing to step down from Freemasonry, and Bill Johnson refuses. Freemasonry is based on Kabbalah. Bethel leaders get blue angels. The NAR leaders get blue angels. So do Freemasons get blue angels. That X is a hand sign of the dead. It has to do with Freemasonry. Joyce Meyer's Hand of Benevolence. Please go watch this video. They speak in signs and symbols. All the abominations in Deuteronomy 18 that say, don't do this, it's an abomination. Those things are found in the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah is what Freemasons teach. Bethel is teaching Kabbalah. The Shekinah is Kabbalah. Shekinah is Lucifer. They are saying, when Corey Asbury sings Shekinah Glory, that's Lucifer worship. Jesus said, have you never read the scriptures? The builders, Freemasons, have rejected the cornerstone. Inside the Passion Translation, Brian Simmons has made Jesus into the keystone of the arch and has re replaced the word builders with masons. Every time, including Sophia, when Chris or anyone else, Paul Young included, refers to the Holy Spirit in a female um, deity as a female deity, that is Gnosticism. This is Kabbalah. The knighting ceremony from Bethel's BSSM. They're Templars. That's a Templar ritual that they are having the students do. The Templars are 32nd degree Freemasons. Every one of the NAR leaders, especially on their book covers and thumbnails for the videos that their churches produce, are using Freemason hand signs. Please feel free to go watch this video and understand these are Freemasons who worship Lucifer and practice Kabbalah. The Enneagram is based on Kabbalah. Here's examples of Mr. White, C. Peter Wagner, John Piper, and Rick Warren teaching Kabbalah. Grave soaking is Kabbalah. The Kundalini spirit is Kabbalah. Chris Valentin teaching that God is er, that the yeah that God is male and female. That's the Adam Kadmon teachings of Kabbalah. Here's Chuck Pierce teaching Kabbalah. Freemasonry, it's the organization, religion tasked with the goal of spreading the light of Lucifer to the world. Its desire is to rebuild Solomon's temple and save humanity through their Messiah, which is uh, Metatron. It is the religion masked and covered by secrets and charities. They are agents of darkness masquerading as dark as agents of light. Satan disguises himself as a worker of light, and his followers decide dis disguise themselves as workers of righteousness. We're going to do a short teaching, and by short, I mean one part. <laughs> um, and as you see, it's called repentance. Is your heart in it? And that last statement will make more sense by the end of the teaching. Um, so let's just get started. So 
So we're currently in the month of Elul, uh, the sixth Hebraic month. Now, traditionally, uh, this is the month, obviously, before month seven, which is when Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot occur. Um, the 40 days, so from the beginning of Elul leading to Yom Kippur, traditionally are a time of repentance before God and restitution to man. So in the sort of Jewish mindset, they try and right the wrongs that they've committed over the past year, both with Yah and both with men, so that when it comes to Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur, they can stand before Yah with integrity. They can come before the king and say, I'm, I've cleared my slate as much as possible. And this is what they do. Like in, we're now in the, we've had the first week of Elul. Um, now, it, what's worth thinking and knowing is that in the Jewish mindset, the Yom Teruah is the day of judgment. It's the day that your sentence is passed. And from Yom Teruah to Yom Kippur, you have a 10 day window and in the Jewish sort of mindset, there were three groups of people. On Yom Teruah, you would have one group where their judgment, you, they get into the kingdom, in you come. Then there's a group where, sorry guys, you didn't, you didn't meet the requirements, out you go. And then there's this group in the middle that they're given a 10 day grace period to try and right those wrongs. So that they've kind of, you know, look, you need to pull your finger out but I'm giving you one last chance. So th this is what's going on in the sort of, on the Jewish riverbank. Right now, uh, in this period of time, you'll find that none of the rabbinic schools argue with each other. All of a sudden they get on and they try, you know, and, the, and the, the biggest thing is restitution to man, making amends with, so let's say I, let's say two months ago, I really offended Jez and uh, you know, and it really did him some damage. I would then go to Jez and I would, not only I would apologize, I would actually say, what can I do to make this right? That's restitution, not saying I'm sorry. So with this sort of, I wanted, this is what inspired this teaching. This idea of let's get ourselves prepared and ready for the fees coming in. Why am I doing this? Because we must be able to stand before our king on judgment day with integrity, not false perfection. Yah doesn't, Yah knows we can't be perfect, right? We're fallen. I'm not trying to make an excuse for our fallen nature, not at all. But Yah doesn't go, oh my goodness, I'd never realized you do this. He's not surprised. So, Instead of trying to turn up on Yom Kippur and say, oh, well, I'm all good. I've done this and I've done that. We need to actually be able to stand with integrity and say, you know what? I have messed up, but I try to do my best to right those wrongs. That's what it means to stand before him with integrity. And this is why I'm kind of going through this now so that what we hear today, we can kind of mull it over and really start looking inside. Repentance is not a one-time transaction. So people think that the, in the, especially in the Western mindset, oh, I've repented, that's it, I'm good. I can get back onto what I was doing. And as uh, Ian mentioned in our Midrash on Monday, as we, were, uh, we went through this with the men, um, this is something you need to be constantly in this state of repentance. You, you don't just kind of coast along and then say, I'm sorry, right your wrongs for a week, and then go back to how you were. We need to be in a constant state of looking in, constant state of submission, and constantly analyzing what we're doing by the book. And by the book, I mean Torah, by Yah's ways. Repentance is not a one-time transaction. It's, it's something we're meant to be in continually. For those, that, well, for those in the discipleship groups, what was one of the rules? you must be in a state of repentance to take part. And, and I can see this in all of you. The key to repentance is your heart. Everything comes from the heart. So let's look at this. This is why I say repentance is your heart in it. 
In Proverbs 16, it says this, to man belongs the preparations of the heart, but from Yah is the answer of the tongue. What belongs to us is the preparation of your heart. One thing that you get, we get handed down to us from Christianity is that Yah's going to wave his big magic hand and poof, I'm a new creation. It doesn't happen that way, right? Because all of us, let us be honest, they're still struggling with stuff. We've come to this faith. Not only that, we claim to have the truth more so than Christianity, yet we still struggle. So clearly, Yah didn't wave a big magic hand and make all our problems go away. Why? Because that belongs to us. Preparation of the heart belongs to man. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, <laughs> but Yah weighs the spirits. You can fool yourself all you want that what you're doing is correct. You can fool yourself and others ooh, all you want to, you know, to appear righteous. But when you stand before Yah on judgment day, he will weigh your spirit. He will weigh your heart. He knows what's going on. He will say, what did you actually do with your heart? Because that belongs to man. In Jeremiah 4, I love this passage, these verses. For this is what Yah said to the men of Yehudah and Yerushalayim. Break up your tillable ground and do not sow among the thorns. Now, in the parable of the sower, we are equated to ground, to soil. What type of ground are you? And I love what Jeremiah says, break up your tillable ground. Do not sow among thorns. What was thorns in that parable? Cares of this world, riches, materialism, worldly things. Circumcise yourselves unto Yah and take away the foreskins of your hearts. You men of Yehudah and inhabitants of Yerushalayim, lest my wrath come forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. To man belongs the preparations of the heart. We're to circumcise ourselves, our hearts, unto Yah. O Yerushalayim, wash your heart from evil and be saved. Till when would your wicked thoughts remain within you? So if anyone says, what do I need to do to be saved? Wash your heart from evil. To man belongs preparations of the heart. Kind of takes, it changes things up a bit, right? We're told just say the sinner's prayer and try and do the best you can. And no, heart circumcision. How's your heart circumcision going on? And again, like I said, the reason I'm doing this is that I want us to be able to stand on Yom Teruah, on Yom Kippur, with integrity. Whether we've nailed it perfectly or whether we've failed miserably, can you stand before him with integrity of heart? Because I see a lot of people that they claim, oh yeah, I've ticked all the boxes. And as we will see, the heart is wicked. I love this, in Ezekiel 18. Therefore, I judge you, O house of Yisrael, everyone according to his ways, declares the Master Yah. Repent and turn back from all your transgressions and let not your crookedness be a stumbling block to you. Cast away all from you all the transgressions by which you have transgressed and make for yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Yisrael? Now, a new heart and a new spirit, where else? What is that linked to, generally? What big promise in scripture is a new heart and a new spirit linked to? Which is the, the new covenant. Well, what was I shall make in that day... I shall make a new covenant with the house of Israel when I put my spirit within their hearts and cause them to walk in my commandments. Make for yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Even in the Torah movement, you will hear that, well, you, you can only do this through the spirit. Yes, I agree. But to man belongs the preparation of the heart. Sometimes, um, you know, in the parable of the sower, the word is, re is referenced to a seed. The seed, you know, being planted in the heart. 
The Spirit can do nothing on your heart if you're hard-hearted, right? If you've got a hard heart, that sea is just going to stay on top, wither away and die. There's, I heard someone say recently that there is nothing wrong with the seed. The seed is perfectly good. It's perfect. It comes from Yah. But what's the problem? The ground on which it, lay, it, it lies on. So, yes, I agree, it is through the Spirit that we are renewed in our nature, but you have to prepare your heart for the Spirit. You have to till the ground. Now, when the tilling of the ground, when that was being said, they didn't have combine harvesters, how did you till ground? By hand, with a shovel. And you got down and you tilled a whole field. You'd, you might, you'd have a cow, okay, I granted. You'd have a cow or a bull dragging this thing, but it was a lot harder work. Make for yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die? It changes the new covenant up a bit, doesn't it? Instead of Yah just saying, you know, by fiat, just changing you. As we will see, the New Testament writers don't teach that. They teach you have to do your bit. And this is what is altogether missed. Doing our part. For I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies, declares the Master Yah. So turn back and live. This is why we need to prepare our hearts, so that we live. And the whole context, that if you read Ezekiel 18, the whole context of the chapter is, if a righteous man is righteous all his life, but then he falls into sin, all his righteousness is forgotten. But the opposite is true. If a wicked man is wicked, but then he repents, then he shall live. So how do we circumcise our hearts? How? It's all, you know, it's all well and good saying circumcise your heart, be circumcised of heart. For the word of Elohim is living and working and sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting through even to the dividing of being and spirit and of joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Right, in the physical when we circumcise, you need a sharp instrument, right? <laughs> you want it to be sharp and precise. The word of Elohim is how we circumcise that, the, the foreskin of the heart. And not only that, it's able to judge the, the intentions and the thoughts of the heart, the very thing that we're told to prepare, the very thing we're told to till and get ready so that that seed can plant and then take root. What's really interesting is, um, I don't know if anyone here has tilled ground before, but my mum has a garden and a veggie patch, and you have to dig deep. You can't just till the surface, because what happens is that the weeds, the roots go down very, very deep. And one thing that I realise is, man, these roots go deep. And, you know, I, I'm talking, I went like two foot down even sometimes a bit deeper, and there are still roots of weeds. And all you need is the tiniest little fragment of a root, and that will, that will become a full weed plant. So think about this in the analogy of tilling the ground. One thing that I realised when I was going through this is that we love to leave those little bits in there, and we think, ah, it's fine, it's not going to do anything. It's just a tiny little thing. Yeah. You watch. Next season round, you've got weeds everywhere. And you think, oh, I wish I'd done it properly. And now you have to leave it in case you tear up all your other plants, right? Again, to man belongs the preparation of the heart, the tilling of the ground. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all are naked and laid bare before the eyes of him who is our account. Again, I said this earlier, you can fool everybody else, you can even fool yourself. But you're not fooling Elohim. He judges the intentions of the heart. We've, one thing I've said before is, it's best to get it out of you now. So that when you come to Judgment Day, it doesn't get pulled out in front of everybody. Deal with it now, it'll be a lot less embarrassing, believe me. Verse 13 tells us why we need to come before him in integrity. Because everything is laid bare before him. He knows why you did stuff. He knows with what spirit you did it in. 
Are you going to say to him, oh, well, I didn't mean it like that? <laughs> Let's look at this thing of coming before Elohim with integrity. Matthew 5, verse 23, if then you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother holds whatever against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First make peace with your brother and then come and offer your gift. This is why restitution is a big part of the month of Elul, this period now, restitution with man. Yar is saying... Like, think about this. You're, you're, why are you going to bring a sacrifice, right? You're, you come in to ask for forgiveness. You're being obedient to the Torah. By doing so, right, you're obeying. You're doing what is right. And he's saying, if you've got something wrong with your brother, don't even bother coming. Why? Can, can you see the hypocrisy? You're exp what did Yeshua say in the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. If you're expecting to come before Elohim on Judgment Day and say, forgive me, I have sinned, and what if he then says to you, well, you didn't forgive your brothers? Why, why should I forgive you? Yeshua said elsewhere, with the same measure you use, it shall be measured unto you. You know, the famous old adage, treat everyone as you want to be treated. This is why restitution, not just asking for forgiveness, but balancing the scales. In the Jewish mindset, like Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur is all about the scales being balanced, being judged according to your works, which Paul says that Elohim will judge us according to our works without partiality. How can you stand before your creator with your head held high when you have a grudge or dispute with your brother? I, I, I honestly, I, I'm almost certain this is going to happen. What, that's why there's going to be weeping, right? And gnashing of teeth on Judgment Day. How about ill feelings? You've got ill feelings towards your brother. And you're going to try and come before Elohim and say, forgive me, please. Have mercy on me. <laughs> why should he show you mercy when you won't show mercy to your brethren? This is what really frustrates me about the so-called Torah movement. Whatever you want to call it, messianic, there's a lot of ill feeling and hatred and backbiting and verbal abuse. Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, go and reprove him between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not hear, take with you one or two or more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word might be established. And if he refuses to hear them, say it to the assembly. And if he refuses to even hear the assembly, let him be to you like a Gentile and a tax collector. The famous Matthew 18 process. Unfortunately, in our modern day, we've reversed it. We tell the assembly first... Then when everybody knows about what's going on, then we might get the leadership involved. And only then will we actually go to the person. Funny that, eh? But here, this is part of this whole making restitution. So here, if, I don't know, if you've been offended by someone, you sure is actually telling you, you need to go to that person and you need to tell them. This has happened I have taken offence for whatever reason. It happens the other way. So what, what it does, it actually puts the onus and the responsibility on both parties. Unfortunately, most people will not undergo this process. Like I just said, the whole thing is being tipped upside down. Gossip, 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 and so forth. The reason, there's a few reasons why people don't go through this process not wanting confrontation is one. People are like, well, it will just go away, right? Cowardice. Some people don't like, they're too afraid to go, like, for fear of what may happen. 
Oh, they may fall out with me and so forth. If they fall out with you for following the scriptural process, then shame on them. What I love about this process is that now both parties are accountable. That there's a proper way of doing things with decency and order. Another reason is subconsciously knowing you may be in the wrong. So what, what do I mean by that? Let's say I'm offended because I'm going to pick on you, Jez, today. Jez has offended me for reason A. And I don't want to go to it because deep down inside, I know that I might actually be wrong in being offended. That he's in the right. This, and this goes to the cowardice of what if this goes to the assembly and then you get told, oh, actually, you're in the wrong. You've got no reason to be offended. Some people don't want to admit that. This is one thing that I do love about this group. I mean, I don't know about the women, but definitely among the men, we're very open with each other. Very open. And we go through this process. And not once in the whole time of this fellowship have we even had to bring it to other people. It's always stayed within the personal one-on-ones, as far as I'm aware anyway. The beauty of this process is that the onus is on the offended party to come forward. If you're offended and you don't go to the persons telling them, you've actually deprived them of the opportunity of repentance. Think about that. Yah says, right, I want you to repent. What if you're the reason someone's not being given the chance to do so? Because some people are, men are very good at this. They offend their wives and the wives are all offended and the men just carry on like, you know, in sunshine happy land. And the woman comes forward and the man goes, what do you mean? I don't know what you're talking about, right? But now, because the woman's come forward, the man can actually own his problem, right? Maybe the woman has a genuine reason, like the man's just, you know, being ignorant and obnoxious. Maybe the woman, do you see what I mean? Let's look at the heart. But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and these defile the man. The whole process, the whole context of this is, you know when the Pharisees are accusing Yeshua's disciples of eating bread with unwashed hands, and they say, ah, oh, and Yeshua says, no, 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 it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you, it's what comes out. But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and these defile the man. For out of the heart comes forth wicked reasonings, murders, adulteries, whorings, thefts, false witnessing, slanders. These defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. The Pharisees thought that they were undefiled by keeping their traditions, okay? You should say, whoa, 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 look, guys, you think you're being righteous because you're doing man-made tradition. And he's saying, you're missing the whole point. Your man-made tradition and all that, it doesn't matter. It's, how, he's saying, what's your heart like? That's what he's saying. What's your heart like? They elevated themselves by the things they did. They thought that the things they did made them like better and righteous. Now, we know that to do Torah is righteousness. But is, as we're going to see, is that all that's needed? Does the tick box approach... To keep in the commandments make you righteous in terms of standing before Elohim on judgment day. Because the Pharisees thought so. That what they did would make them clean. Your heart will be the source of either your defilement or your sanctification. You, you get to choose, right? From the heart will either come defilement or if you allow the spirit to work on your heart, to write that law on your heart, for the word to dig root deep, then that will begin the process of sanctification. Right? So which will it be? Watch your heart. This is why we must be men or women after Yah's own heart. Because if we're chasing Yah's heart, then do you see what I mean? It, 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 everyone's heard this, there's two natures inside of man, right? The one you feed the most is the one that will win. 
What are you dwelling on? What are you meditating on day and night? Because we're told, well, what are we told by David? That we're to meditate on his Torah, on his ways. Day and night. We must guard our hearts. Because it, from the heart stems everything. Um, you'll usually find that temptation will present itself. And you'll be initially like that. And it's only when you dwell on it, you, you, you leave it in the, in the mind, that like, you either win or lose in the mind. And if you lose, it sinks down. And then it goes down to the heart. And then eventually that takes roots and it ends up coming back out of you, right? Through your mouth, through your actions. We must guard our hearts. Guard yourselves lest your heart be deceived. Not you, lest your heart be deceived. And you turn aside and serve other mighty ones and bow down to them. You know, how about King me? I'm going to be my own Elohim today. <laughs> Be on guard, lest there be a thought of Belial in your heart, saying the seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye is evil, which means to be stingy, against your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he shall cry out to Yah against you, and it shall be a sin to you. The whole thing was, you know how in the seventh year, debts were forgiven. And Yah is saying, if that man comes up to you needing something, before, and it's right near the, the, the year of release, you're to give him that. You're not to think, oh, I'm not going to get it back. I'm going to have to cancel my debt. It's a wicked thought, and it starts in your heart. Then that manifests into action. Look, I'm going to be honest, guys. I, we all have thoughts like these. We, we, you, you, you see yourself, you think one way, and you have to stop and double take and go, whoa, where's this coming from? This is a wicked thought. Why am I feeling this way? We're told to guard ourselves against these things. Nowhere does it say that the devil made you do it there either, right? Oh, the devil made me. He planted seeds in my mind. <laughs> he, he, the devil's your cheerleader. He's the person that's saying, go on, go on. You know you want to. You want it anyway. Just have it. Brood of adders, how are you able to speak what is good, being wicked? For from the mouth speaks, for the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. How can you even say good words when your heart is wicked? The good man brings forth what is good from the treasures of his heart, and the wicked man brings forth what is wicked from the wicked treasure. So if you're being pumped full of like you know the garbage that the media is pumping at you the, and all this nonsense what do you think is going to come out of you but if you're dwelling on his torah day and night letting that sink in your heart what do you think will come out of you You know, what do you treasure? What do you treasure? And I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they shall give an account of it in the day of judgment. When going through and putting this teaching together, I got, I read this in a new light. You know, what about the people that say all these wonderful words and, you know, they say all the right things, but inside it's void. That, that their words become worthless they're idle they don't do anything they don't mean anything there's a lot of people that are playing righteous and those will be idle words for by your words you shall be declared righteous and by your words you shall be declared unrighteous is it literally because of what you say you'll be declared righteous or is it because of what's overflowing from your heart the state of your heart will determine what comes out of your mouth. And that will, it's, think of it as the litmus test. Is this person righteous or not? Well, let's stand back and watch for a bit. Some people, it comes out in a week. Some people, a few years, they keep that facade going, right? Eventually, the cracks show. I believe this is what it truly means to confess Messiah. You know, it says that uh, Paul speaks about that with the mouth we confess to Messiah and that gives us an eternal life. 
Is it literally, this is where Christianity says, just say the sinner's, sinner's prayer, right? Confess with your mouth and be saved. What is your confession? Why? Because it's in my heart. I confess it. It overflows. My actions, my words, everything about you should be a confession of who you serve. That's what it means to confess Messiah. Your confession is more than just your words. Your words are just an indicator of what's going on inside of you. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are very good with their words and inside the very wicked. Just go watch a false teacher. The words and actions that come forth from you are a litmus test for what is inside of you. The, you know, you can, someone can pretend to be something they're not all they want, but eventually the cracks show. There's only so long you can play the facade. Now, unfortunately for us, we're trying to get from filthy unrighteous and dishonest to something pure. We can't play the facade. And sometimes I think that we get kind of too caught up trying. We're, we're, we're like, oh, well, if I just do these things and say these things, it will fix what's going on inside. No, you, you, you fix what's inside and then the rest follows. Because again, well, what did we read earlier? Everything is laid bare before him, naked. And this idea is being uncovered. There's no one there to protect you. It's just you and your creator. No matter how much one tried to play their facade, the cracks will eventually show and they will be seen for what they are, even if that day is judgment day, when the books are opened. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you tithe the mint and the anise and the cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the Torah, the right ruling, the compassion and the belief, the faith. These need to have been done without neglecting the others. They'd missed the whole point. They were doing their tick box approach, tick, 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 and they'd missed the whole point of it. Now, let me say this, obedience is not on the stand here. It's, it, obedience is a requirement. It says these, the weightier matters, need to have been done without neglecting the others. The tithing of the mint, the dill, the cumin and all that. You're expected to do that. But you, you're missing out on what it's about. This is the difference between the letter and the spirit of the law. So the example I like to give... Normally, on a cul-de-sac street, your driving limit is 30 mile an hour, right? But outside of school, it will be 20 mile an hour. Special speed limit when school's on, right? Now, the letter of the law says you have to drive up to 20 miles an hour. Now, let's just say I'm driving along and a kid runs out and I'm driving 15 miles an hour. I'm thinking, oh, I'm under the speed limit. Bang! And then the, the judge says, why did you hit the kid? I was driving in the speed limit. I was following the letter of the law. But what's the law there for in the first place, right? For safety of children. You've completely missed the point of driving slower. The, the, the point of it was to increase safety. But do you see what I mean? The spirit of the law, however, will never negate the letter of the law. Never. And this is where Christianity has gone too far one way. They're like, oh, well, I'll do the spirit of the law while negating the letter. You know, the obvious, an easy one is, I don't know, Shabbat. They say, oh, well, I'm resting, I'm resting. But then they'll happily make other people work or, you know, they'll go about their business and do whatever. Oh, but I'm just taking it, I'm taking it easy today. You've missed the whole point of Shabbat. To meet with one another, to have fellowship, to dwell on him. To forget, forget, you know, we have to remember Shabbat is set apart. It's kadosh. Why are you doing things that are not set apart on that day? The problem is the Pharisees were keeping the letter that negated the spirit. They were hitting them kids at 50 miles an hour. Does that make sense? The spirit will never negate the letter, ever. Because if not, Yah's... Hypocritical. 
Let's keep going. Blind guide straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. You know, just think, a gnat's this tiny thing, and you're like that, and they've just swallowed a camel. This is what they were doing. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are filled with plunder and unrighteousness. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish so that the outside of them becomes clean too. Way to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly indeed look well, but inside are filled with dead men's bones and all uncleanness. They, they, they thought that by doing and saying these things on the outside, the inside would be fixed. And just go look on Facebook, is all I'll say. Go look on YouTube in a thread or in a comment section. A lot of people saying and doing the right things, but the inside is wicked. Sort the inside out and the, the, the obedience and the good words will come naturally. You won't even have to try You'll just be. So you too outwardly indeed appear righteous to men, but inside you are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. A tick box obedience will avail to nothing and is meaningless. Meaningless. The promise of the renewed covenant is that the law will be written on your heart, not on your face. Tick box obedience will avail to nothing and is meaningless. No matter what you do without a clean heart, it is worthless. It's a bold statement, but I think you should have backed me up on this. I've said this before, you, you, you can come to Shabbat, you can still be a miserable sod. Let's look at what is actually required. With what shall I come before Yah? Bow myself before the high Elohim. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? With all these wonderful works and show of religion and being spiritual? Is Yah pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my being? He has declared to you, O oh man, what is good, and what does Yah require of you but to do right, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your Elohim. There's three things there. Doing right. Okay, let, we've, we know what doing right, right? Obedience. He's asked you to do something, do it. Like I said, obedience is not up for negotiation. It's a basic requirement. But you're also expected to love kindness and to walk humbly with your Elohim. Were the Pharisees walking humbly? Or did they love to stand on the street corners, right? Praying and look at, making it obvious they were fasting and having ropes for Zizi. And <laughs> did they love kindness? Well, apparently not, because you sure called them out for missing out on the compassion. Verse 8 shows us the threefold requirement of our faith. There's three requirements. This is why Shaul, Paul, says that we are not saved by works, but by faith. True faith will have these three things. Doing good, there's your works. Doing good, loving kindness, walking humbly. You can do all the works you want. If you're walking around in pride, you, you, you've not got the faith, the true belief, the faith of Abraham. Obedience is never up for negotiation, but how you do it will say a lot about... If you're walking in obedience, but doing so in pride, last time I checked, that's why Satan fell. Pride. It, it was the first sin, right? Pride. Do you think Elohim is going to allow that into his kingdom again? <laughs> again, one point does not negate the other. So the Pharisees, they were doing good, do good, do good. Even now in modern Judaism, what do they say? Do charity, right? Do charity. Christianity 
but they've gone too far the other way. They, they, they just love everybody, right? Love kindness. And some might be humble. Again, one does not negate the other. You need all three. If not, I'm going to say it, your faith is meaningless. It's, well, it's not the faith that he's requiring of you. These things need to have been done without neglecting the others. James 4 verse 8. Draw near to Elohim and he shall draw near to you. See the process there. You draw near to him first and then he'll draw near to you. How do you do that? Cleanse your hands, sinners. Cleanse the hearts, you double-minded. Your hands, your actions, your deeds. But that's not enough. Your hearts, you double-minded. Lament, war, mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to dejection. Lay yourself low. Humble yourselves in the sight of the master and he shall lift you up. Right there, th those three things. Do good, cle cleanse your hands. Love kindness, cleanse your heart. Humble yourselves, walk humbly before your Elohim. James is saying the same things. We're expected to draw near to him before he draws near to us. Now, if you look at the sacrificial system, he's pretty clear on how he, he expects you to draw near to him. Yeshua said even on top of that, if you've got a problem with your brother, don't even bother drawing near. Sort that out first, then come to the altar. We draw near by cleansing our hands and our hearts. To have unclean hands and a clean heart is double-mindedness. To have clean hands and an unclean heart is double-mindedness. And all this needs to be done in humility. The opposite of pride and arrogance. Acts 15 verse 5. And some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them, the Gentiles that were coming in to the faith, and to command them to keep the Torah of Moshe. And the emissaries and elders came together to look into this matter. And when they heard, well, sorry, when there had been much dispute, Kephar rose up and said to them, Men, brothers, you know that a good while ago Elohim chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the good news and believe. And Elohim, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the set-apart spirit as also to us and made no distinction between us and them, Cleansing their heart by belief. True faith, which is to do good, to love kindness, to walk humbly, is the key to the start of your heart being cleansed. Now, what does he go on further on and say? That let them go to the synagogues on the Shabbat, where every week Moses, the Torah, is being preached. Again, obedience is not on the stand. It, I will never say obedience is up for negotiation, ever. But your heart will manifest through your works, through what you say. True faith, though, is the key. An honest faith with integrity <coughs> goes a long way. These people had integrity. They, they were willing to submit and to do what was right. It's part of the cleansing process. I would argue it's the beginning. True faith is the beginning of that cleansing process. It is what enables us to be humble enough to accept correction. Without correction, right, you, the, the word cannot, it's the equivalent of hardening your heart. That sword cannot circumcise the, that foreskin. The, the spade cannot get into that hard ground for the seed to, to, to be planted, for the weeds to be pulled out. You know, tilling ground is not fun. True faith will enable us to be humble enough to accept correction. 1 John 3, 
See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of Elohim. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved ones, now we are children of Elohim, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone having this expectation in him cleanses himself as he is clean. In the book of Hebrews, it says that without being set apart, without holiness, no one will see the master. Again, what did I say at the beginning? Well, what did Proverbs say? To man belongs the preparations of the heart. Yah's not going to wave his big hand and go, there you go, mate, fixed it for you. you. He wants you to draw near to him. Again, cleansing our heart is expected from us. It is a requirement. And part of that is obedience to his commands. It's not the only thing, but it's part of it. One point does not negate the other. And as Yeshua, Matthew 9, 9, as Yeshua passed on from there, he saw a man called Matityahu sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And it came to be as Yeshua sat at the table in the house that see many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his taught ones. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his taught ones, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Yeshua hearing this said to them, those who are strong have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not offering sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. Again, Yeshua's pulling them up on this he's saying where's your compassion guys you're missing out Micah right okay you, you, you're, you're tick boxing great wonderful you've missed the compassion the belief the Pharisees thought that what they did made them better than other people and that's why you should pull him up on At that time, Yeshua went through the grain fields on the Shabbat, and his taught ones were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your taught ones are doing what is not right to do on the Sabbath, according to men, right? According to their made up traditions. But he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and he and those who were with him? How he went into the house of Elohim and ate the showbread, which was not right for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Go read in the Torah, it says, only the priest is to eat of this. Go read the story now with David. They were allowed to eat of it, and the priest said that the only requirement was that they'd not been with a woman, that they were not ritually unclean. Or did you not read in the Torah that on the Sabbath, the priests in the set-apart place profane the Sabbath and are blameless? He's referring to the fact that they have to kill and slaughter animals, work, manual labor, on the Shabbat. They would also, if a circumcision happened on the Sabbath day, you went ahead with the circumcision because it had to happen on the eighth day. But I say to you that in this place is, there is one greater than the set-apart place. And if you had not known what this means, I desire compassion and not offering, you would have not condemned the blameless. Now, Christianity will say that because of what we've just read, you can now pretty much do away with a lot of the commands as you see fit, as long as it's doing good. In David's case, if he didn't eat, he was going to die. His men were going to die. And the priest said, had, what did he do? He had compassion. If you read the account, he, put, he still put some stipulations that had to be clean. For the son of Adam is the master of the Sabbath. Why is Yeshua getting at the Pharisees? Because they think, that they're so caught up in that letter of the law that they've missed the whole point of it. Like I said, they're hitting those children at 15 mile an hour in the car. Completely missing the fact that they're supposed to be saving them. And do you see what I mean? 
Again, obedience is not up for debate, but what's the source of your obedience? Is it in meekness? Is it in humility? Because the Pharisees, what they were doing, they were condemning people for not doing things how they saw fit. They elevated themselves by what they did. I love this. Luke 18, verse 10. Two men went up to the set-apart place to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and began to pray with himself this way. Elohim, I thank you that I am not like the rest of men, swindlers, unrighteous, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. I do all these wonderful works righteousness charity i do all this stuff but the tax collector standing at a distance would not even raise his eyes to the heaven but was beating his breast saying elohim show favor unto me a sinner i say to you this man went down to his house declared right rather than the other one for everyone who is exalting himself shall be humbled, and he who is humbling himself shall be exalted. The tax collectors were considered like the dregs of society. They were seen as traitors, Jewish people collecting taxes on behalf of Rome from their own people. Right? They were, let's put it in modern day, the, the preacher and the drug dealer. Which one had integrity? Elohim is not impressed by how much of the Torah you can keep. He's not going to go on Judgment Day and go, whoa, that was impressive. What he will be impressed with is your obedience when accompanied by loving kindness and walking in humility. That Pharisee, he was tithing, I can guarantee he was keeping Shabbat, he was keeping feasts, he was eating kosher, but he'd exalted himself. Pride, arrogance, probably had no compassion, probably wouldn't even sit with a tax collector. We must get over the fact that we can't walk out our faith in perfection. So this is the flip side of it. It says here, for everyone who is exalting himself shall be humbled, but he who is humbling himself shall be exalted. The problem is, is that we either have false humility going on or we have self-abasement. People like, I call it reverse pride. People that, um, like, that, that they'll beat themselves up and put themselves so low into the ground that they, they won't accept help from anyone, they don't want to cause a fuss. That's not, that's not humility. That, that's beating yourself into the ground. I said this in, on Monday night with the men, but we, we've got this idea that if you're humble, you're not allowed to say it. The minute you say, oh, I'm humble, oh, you're being arrogant and proud, Yeshua said, be like me, I am meek and humble. Was he being arrogant? We need to understand what humility is. It doesn't mean pretending, oh, you know, like, oh, you can go in the line for the food before me. Let me help you, let me do this and make myself all glorified in the process. It also doesn't mean like making yourself worthless. What Yah wants is integrity. Integrity. Again, is Yah shocked by the fact that you sin? Is he surprised? That's a better word. Is he surprised that you sin? I'm not trying to condone your sin. Don't get me wrong. Don't put words into my mouth. We should not sin. But is he surprised when we do? No. So let's get over that and move forward, right? You are the light of the world. It is impossible for a city to be hidden on a mountain, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it shines to all those in the house. This is temple talk. Think menorah in the house, the temple. Let your light so shine before men so that they see your good works and praise your Father who is in the heavens. We're supposed to be a light. Do you think that tick box approach while beating everyone down is being a light to everyone? 
Because I can assure you that those on the outside watching in see it for what it is. We're supposed to be a light to the world. And that's with the threefold faith. Doing good, loving kindness, walking humbly. Light will do one of two things in these dark days. It will bring in the lost who are seeking. So they're in darkness themselves and they see a light, they'll go. Or it will scatter the darkness. Why? Because of this. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. For their works were wicked. For everyone who is practicing evil matters hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But the one doing the truth comes to the light. There's your doing right, doing good. So that his works are clearly seen that they have been wrought in Elohim. No one likes to be exposed for what they are. So you've got a choice. Either get your heart right or let Elohim expose you. Because he will. The lamp is the eye of the body. Therefore, if your eye is good, all your body shall be enlightened. This idea of a good eye means to be generous. But if your eye is evil, if you're tight-fisted, all your body shall be darkened. If then the light that is within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, I know this Yeshua is using this in the context of materialism and being tight-fisted and generous, but the point I want to get to is if the, what you claim to be light inside of you is actually darkness, what is it that you're actually putting out? Bring this back to being a whitewashed too. If you can be pretty on the outside, but if what's on the inside is death and lawlessness, darkness, how great is that darkness? No one is able to serve two masters, for either he shall hate the one and love the other, or else he shall cleave to one and despise the other. You are not able to serve Elohim and Mammon. What did we read just earlier? That those who do not like the light... They, they run from it. Who are you going to serve, light or darkness? What is inside of you? The, the, again, this goes back to having integrity. You're not fooling Elohim. It's better to say to Elohim, Father, I've got some darkness inside of me. Sort it out. Help me sort it out. You can work with that. Does the outside reflect what is going on on the inside? This is uh, yeah, speaking to Solomon, 1 Kings 9. And you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness, to do according to all that I have commanded you. If you guard my laws and my right rulings. Again, obedience is not on the stand here. But your integrity is. Are you going to have integrity of heart? Then I shall establish the throne of your reign over Israel forever. As I promised David your father saying. There is not to cease a man of yours on the throne of Israel. Now what is promised to the bride? To sit on his throne as he sat on his father's throne. If you're a bride, this applies to you. If we walk in integrity of heart. Note that that was the first thing Yah picked up on. Then the uprightness, then the obedience. Let's remember, David was a murderer. A conspirator and an adulterer. But yet he had a, Yah, a heart after Yah's own heart. Why? Because he had integrity. He admitted. He's, he didn't try and bluff Yah. The minute the prophet Nathan came up to him and says, you're that man, he just fessed up straight away. And he took the punishment that came his way. And he took it like a man. So, I will ask you the question I asked at the beginning. Repentance is your heart 
in it. Does that make more sense now? I want us to be able to stand before Elohim, not in false perfection, but in integrity. Because that's what Elohim demands of us. You know, sometimes we think that we can't be honest with Elohim. What do I mean? Once, about a year or two ago, I had to admit to Elohim that I was angry at him. That my, like, in my spirit, I knew I was happy with my walk. Don't get me wrong. And I wouldn't have changed it, and I still wouldn't change it, but my flesh inside of me was kicking and screaming, and it, I built up resentment. I was angry that I couldn't do this, couldn't do that. Life wasn't easy anymore, right? It's a, const it's a daily struggle. Take up your cross daily. And that over the time had been, and I had to come before him and say, Father, I know I've got absolutely no right whatsoever to feel this, but I feel this way. And he was able to work with that. And now I don't have any resentment. I'm not angry at him. I just accept and that's fine. Again, Yah's not surprised by our disgusting matters. He's not surprised. And you don't shock him. He just wants you to have integrity. That integrity, work on that, plough the ground, the rest will follow. Obedience will become a natural outpouring. I hope that's been a blessing and something to get you to start thinking as we come up to Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur. Amen.